Hi everyone, welcome to Asami Rat Care and um, today's video is going to be all about does again um, I'm with Wick here to demonstrate um, but in particular around does we're going to continue the doe series and look at behaviour and I'm going to kind of try and talk you through um, some of the kind of general misconceptions sometimes about doe behaviour and some of the general um, kind of ways it changes as they age and then I'm going to have a quick look at introductions and some of the kind of temperament problems, I suppose you could say, that you may experience as well in, in their kind of lifestyles. So first thing um, to talk about is um, what people broadly think those temperament is like. So when, when, when people ask, do you want books or does and what the temperament's like, straight away people say, well, books are lazy and those are insane. Um, and I'll be honest, my does pretty much are insane. Um, however, that does not mean all does are. Much like not all books are lazy, a lot of that is down to the line, um, the, the kind of genetics um, temperament, but also how you raise them as well. And because my lot, um, I like um, an explorative, active, slightly crazy temperament. Um, and then I select for that in the parents, so I get the genetic side of things. And um, because I also... Um, tend to raise them with lots of things to do to explore if you've watched my breeding videos you can see how, how we go about it then um, you can also see that that has an impact on them that's their normal that kind of running around exploring as much as Twiz is having a bit of a cuddle there um, that's because she's randomly scared of something and I'm not sure what she's got this little wide-eyed oh my god what's happened um, she'll settle down and be off again soon but yes, as much as you can get cuddles from your girls, as Twiz is demonstrating very adequately, um, they also, they do like to do things and climb. So your average temperament for, for a girl, I would say, is probably marginally more active than a book. Um, and I think a lot of that is to do with the fact that they are um, kind of physically more agile. But then there's also things around about um, what would they typically need to do in the wild so if you think back to the wild it's the same thing as when we're talking about book behavior what a doe's purpose in life is to effectively um, find herself somewhere safe to live and then forage for good food and have babies and feed those babies unlike in some species where the male goes out and finds food for the babies and brings it back it's generally not the case with with rats um, where, where you potentially might get some males assisting um, in general, the doe does most of the work. They look after the babies, they feed the babies, um, they feed themselves, which gives them in turn the milk to feed the babies. And um, the male is not bringing the doe pre presents back. Once he's um, banged, knocked her up, <laughs> once he's done his job, then that's it, he's out of it. Um, and it's it's pretty much down to the doe. I mean, in some cases, breeders will leave um, books in with the doe, which is not a good idea, I should say, because ultimately the doe will become pregnant again straight after birth or possibly slightly before. Um, but effectively, she will then raise back to back litters, which isn't good for her. But if a book is in with his own babies, he will generally kind of be very pleasant to them, nice. But if it's um, somebody else's babies, we seem to have either a large moth or a um, butterfly in here. So if you see something fly back the camera, that's that. Um, the rats will probably start hunting it down soon. Somewhat distracting. But yes, so yeah, while, while books will tolerate their own babies, they will generally kill others, other babies, particularly when they're kind of that small age. Not out of any particular spite, um, though it, there is a degree of their competitions for their own offspring, um, but actually because they're small pocket-sized meals, really, um, and it might sound horrible to us, but to them, they, they're not kind of like carrying genetic information from that person. Um, you know, there's no particular reason for that book to keep them going. I think there's evidence that perhaps if they're somewhat related, it might go better. Um, because um, interestingly, you don't have to be the parent for it to carry your genetic information. But I'm getting way off topic there. It's quite an interesting topic though. But yes, so in the wild, um, the doe's job is basically to fend for, to feed her family, and also to kind of to be able to find a good, safe environment. And to do that, she has to be um, much more kind of active in the wild so she will have to do a lot more running around she's not just feeding herself ultimately like the boys are she's also she's feeding um a, a litter and in the wild they will have litters fairly regularly um so that does kind of dictate a little bit more of a natural kind of slightly more active temperament um also a little bit more creative um 
at times. I mean, not, not to say books are stupid, they're not. They can be very, very clever. They tend to, tend to take a bit more time thinking things through, whereas those seem almost instinctive problem solvers, um, which is quite an interesting one, but makes sense if you think that they have to be more creative when they're looking for food, for kind of larger amounts of animals. Um, but yes, so then you may notice a little bit of difference, but a lot of it is down to the kind of like general, um, kind of general way they're brought up. One thing I have definitely noticed though, and I mentioned this is the book video, um, the main difference for me between book, books and does is how much they need you. Um, does and my girls do love me and they regularly come and visit me and we have little cuddles and we have a nice time, um, but they don't need me. Um, and that is actually quite nice from my point of view. Um, the fact that they are perfectly content wandering around and exploring. And that's not to say you don't get the odd clingy dog, you do. Um, but I would say 90% of my books are clingy, as I say, creepy and like to stare at me. Um, whereas probably only 10% of those are um, at that level. And at the moment, I've not got one that's too clingy. Occasionally, Snufkin will just want to come and sit on me and lick me. Um, I don't know if that's just her staking a claim on me when the others are interested in me or not. But mostly it's this kind of stuff that... Um, little worm has come, which is just come up, have a bit of a sniff, have a bit of a play, and then wander off and do her own thing again. But she wants to check in and, you know, make her presence felt. But it's not like a book where she wants that reassurance. And, and that is the kind of main difference, really, for me. Um, and it's something that I think most people that have owned books and those have noticed. Um, and it's why some people absolutely adore books and some people absolutely adore those, because it's actually nice to be chosen rather than needed. Um, and that is something that's kind of quite a blessing. And um, if I had to pick an absolute favourite sex, then that would probably come down to it for me. I would always rather be chosen than um, be a necess necessity. Um, but in reality, keeping both of them is brilliant. Plus, you, you know, it can be little insane um, things like little worm, um, who just want to play all the time. You're a good girl, aren't you, miss? Though, to be fair, Kit wants to play all the time as well, and he's a book. <laughs> um, but yes, so that's from a kind of general temperament point of view. Now, if we think about how that temperament can change as they grow. So in books, there was quite distinct things to do with sexual maturity and such. With those, it is similar in a way, um, but the kind of cycle is a lot faster. So we talk, talked about heat periods in the kind of last video. Now, one thing to bear in mind with heat periods is when a doe is on heat, they can be incredibly jumpy, particularly early on. So when they get their first heat, which is normally around about the six week mark, um, give or take, um, a doe will get a sudden influx of hormones for about half a day and it can make them go like really just freak out and like we're talking about a very strong reaction not just when you touch the back jumping but seriously kind of like screaming in, in almost fear over nothing and that can happen it doesn't happen with every doe but it is more common in that first heat and actually in those early heats before they get used to this massive spike in hormones um, so you have to kind of take that into account and give them a little bit of leeway um, some does feel heat very strongly and they all react quite dramatically to heat whereas others will just like not even seem to notice half the time in fact it's quite hard to tell they're on heat unless they're kind of in with a book um, and that is something that you kind of be, be aware of I've seen does that become like regularly unhandleable every four and a half or five days um, when they're on heat and yet absolute sweethearts the rest of the time and that is just this really strong reaction to the kind of all the hormones that are going on in that period of time. So that goes through a doe's life um, and they will kind of have intermittent heats um, right into relative old age. Though they, they get further and further apart when they get kind of older um, and you may not notice them after a while. They may need something to trigger them like an introduction. Um, and it, it's kind of it's quite interesting in that sense. Um, you just want to eat something don't you miss um so that's kind of quite significant but they don't have what i would term as a hormonal period in the same way that books do so books when they hit to teenage get their kind of big whack of hormones those don't have it in the same way however what they do get um, which influences their behavior and can get them to be a bit arsy when they're babies they're very playful very kind of um hyper silly jumpy ping on everybody um, no concept of danger um, as they mature and get physically, um, they get put, put in the place quite a lot by the older rats, which is good. That's kind of part of growing up. You need your rules. Um, but what will eventually happen is they'll get to the point where they're physically bigger and they think they can have a go. And it's not like books. They don't have like this massive hormonal surge that kind of makes them suddenly think, right, I must take over this hierarchy. 
Instead, it's all kind of going back to this idea that they're competing for resources. Ultimately, they're trying to get they're not trying to get the best mate. Um, the book will do the work on that and they will find them. Um, and basically the books aren't that fussy if it's female and it's on heat. They have a, probably going to be up for it unless you want them to mate and then they're not interested. Um, but that's just one of the joys of being a breeder. Um, so basically they, they have this kind of competition for resources because ultimately when resources are, are kind of quite low, quite poor, um, then it matters as a doe to make sure that you're in a position where you can feed your babies. And that's biological driver. That's kind of fundamental. Um, but it's not the same way as kind of competing for a mating. Um, you don't have to be absolutely at the top. Um, you don't have to be the fastest runner and the kind of bulkiest. What you do want to do is make sure somebody's not going to steal your meal when you're eating it. Um, so actually, I found that girls are generally a bit more competitive over food. If you put in um, one less bone than there is rats with those, it's quite hilarious. Um, with books, they, they kind of eventually learn to share a lot faster than the does do, actually. Um, but that's, that kind of makes sense. But it does mean that whilst with books, um, it's pretty predictable that you're going to have problems around the teenage kind of years. With does, um, you've not got really a predictable age, but as they feel they've got... Um, Sorry, because people are destroying the rat room as usual. Um, but as they feel they've got a bit of a chance to kind of make their make the others in the hierarchy respect them a bit more formally, um, they might have a go. Um, and what you'll also find is you quite often have does that like to be the rats that are doing the humping when somebody else is on heat. Um, I've got Bug at the moment. Um, she's not coming. Oh, she did briefly come and visit me when I had worm earlier. Um, but she's around. Um, and she is a very good rat for judging when another rat's on heat because she will be humping, to, humping it, definitely stuck to its backside. Um, quite amusing, really, um, and quite useful, actually, when you're trying to work out who's on heat at a particular time. Um, but not every rat will do that, and that's just because Bug, Bug has that thing about her which says she's going to be a fairly dominant rat in the pack. Um, and I should make a quick note about um, hierarchy here, actually, for does. Hierarchy in does is a lot less formal, I would say, than books. And even then, we, when we spoke about books, book, form, book hierarchy isn't, I'm boss rat, you're second, you're third, and that's it. Um, there is a bit more flexibility. But within a doe cage, I would say it's fairly common to have um, more than one kind of, I wouldn't say top rat, but quite dominant rat. So they're, they're, they tend to be the rats that everybody respects so they don't take the piss out of and they don't take the food off them um, that can generally wade in and just sit and settle a, a kind of argument that's going on um, they tend to be like like the kind of matriarchs of a group um, it's a good term really um, because they provide a kind of a steady assurance so um, I remember it was, it was probably a, probably a couple of months ago I've lost a couple of rats in, in that time but um, at one stage I had three effective kind of leaders of my cage. I had Chocobo, who was the kind of old lady, um, but she'd been such a good alpha for such a long time that everybody had, was full of respect for her, even though she couldn't really walk particularly well because she had hind leg degeneration and she had a bit of a mammary mass. Um, nobody took the piss of Chocobo and um, she was still very well respected. And if somebody was having a bit of a kind of bicker session and she wandered over, um, her presence calms things down. And then you had um, Fu, who was the logical alpha candidate because she was the kind of strongest, fittest, um, kind of physical prime of her life type rat. She'd just come off a litter um, and her babies were joined in the cage. So she had that kind of status from that. Um, so she was kind of quite confident in charge. Um, I will say she, Fu doesn't have that I want to be the boss rat thing. Just at that period in time, she was quite, quite kind of quite high up, quite confident. In fact, here's Fu, she's come and visited us. Um, and so she was also very dominant, but she would not do anything to Chocobo. And Chocobo would not try anything on with her. Mutual respect there. And then we had um, Wick, who is down there somewhere. At that stage, Wick was not pregnant, which Wick was younger. She wasn't in a prime. Currently, she's prime. And um, I'm convinced as soon as she goes back in the cage, she will just go straight to the top of, of the pack. Just it's her nature. But Wick has always had that thing about her where she's had the drive to want to be quite high up in the hierarchy. Um, and she just didn't quite have the physical presence to do it. But because she was so kind of self-assured and confident and convinced that she would be, she was still very high ranking. And what you tend to get is you might get, they were all kind of like, 
Fu and Wick were a little bit like cautious around each other, where Chocobo just, you know, she didn't, she, she knew she was in charge. Um, even if she wasn't really actually in charge, she didn't actively have much of a kind of effect on the um, hierarchy. This is book, by the way. Um, but um, she, she knew she was not being threatened in her position. Um, whereas you got kind of like your Wicks and Foos of the world um, having little disagreements from time to time, but generally quite respectful of each other. And then you got um, Twiz, bless her. Twiz is, is, is not as physically kind of muscular and strong as the others. And she really wanted to be in charge, but everybody, and that thing, includes Chocobo, I think, actually, would knock her over <laughs> at times, even though she was trying her hardest. Even the babies used to double team her and, and knock her over. Um, and it kind of like shows the, the kind of hierarchy. Oh, you got Snufkin was in there as well. And Snufkin, nobody really kind of wants to annoy because she's physically a reasonable size. But she has had zero interest in the um, hierarchy at the time because she was fully comfortable with Chocobo um, and her position and didn't want to challenge Fu. Interestingly, since Chocobo's gone, Snufkin's actually risen up the hierarchy and her and um, Fu are currently ru ruling the cage while, um, while Wick's on her babies. But when you go back in, it's going to be a very simple thing. Isn't it? Every time she goes back in to um, visit them when she's um, off the babies for a bit, um, she just goes and knocks everybody over, everybody lets her, and then it gets on fine. So it kind of just shows, it's quite a kind of complicated picture with those, and it's really fascinating to watch, particularly when you've got a decent sized group. As much as mine's a little bit smaller than I would like at the moment, um, you still see all these interactions, and it does matter about what they're fighting over as well. When I say fighting, what they're competing for. So some rats will be, again, very driven for a particular piece of food. Some rats will particularly want to be groomed or do the grooming. Um, some rats will just want to be left alone <laughs> um, sometimes rather than kind of harassed by small annoying babies. Um, we all feel that sometimes, I think. Um, but that's kind of um, why, where you see that different rats will take the strong lead in those areas. But it is generally a bit more cooperative in girls and it is quite normal to have more than one rat that's quite senior um, and then split the duties between themselves in a lot of senses. Um, so that's the hierarchy point of view. So then let's think a little bit about, um, as, you, as you get through, so that's kind of passed through adulthood into old age. So what are some of the problems that can come with old age? So unlike um, books where you tend to see your problems in the teenage months, um, with those, we tend to see hormonal type problems. And I'm just going to have to stop Bob going to visit the babies. And yes, trouble. Right there. She worked out a way of climbing up onto the work surface. The babies aren't currently out because I cannot supervise their man this lot at the same time as filming. Um, but it would have caused problems if she got up there and sniffed the babies through the bars. Um, but yes, so as those get older, um, they can have various changes that can cause hormonal-like symptoms. And they are, when I say hormonal-like, they are actually hormonal symptoms. So probably the main one, um, most common, and actually I think a lot more common than we realise, is something called polycystic ovaries. And this is something that us humans get as well. And effectively what happens is you'll notice um, a doe get grumpy. Um, and there is not really a much better term for it. Um, generally they just get irritated by others and um, things that might not have irritated them in the past start winding them up and um, they get quite kind of tense and annoyed by it um, sometimes they lash out at the people as well it's I'd say, say it's more common for them to lash out at other rats than their humans but it can happen but effectively it is a change from their normal and and they do become kind of grumpy and more um, more works up over things quite easily it's not like a book hormonal thing where they'll be scent marking everywhere it's just they get pissed off and, and they will lash out and nip or such when that happens um, and and that is effectively because they've got these um, poly polycystic ovaries um, and it causes kind of hormonal fluctuations but it also is quite painful too and it, it's it's at this well at least it is in humans there's been no studies really looking at the pain levels in rats that I found. It doesn't mean there isn't any. Um, but it's reasonable to assume that it is quite uncomfortable for the rats as well, which is probably partly why they're getting pissed off. Um, so the main problem with that is that ultimately there's very little that you can pick up other than these kind of temperament changes. Um, and it's not something that you can get a scan done and see because as much as things like ultrasound in, will pick it up fine in humans, what we're talking about in rats is something enormously tiny 
that's kind of deep inside and it's just not something that the kind of kits that we've currently got will be able to reliably pick up. Um, so effectively, when you're seeing that rat getting grumpy, your only way to find out if it is polycystic ovaries, um, I think she might be on heat. <laughs> yes, you are. Yes, you are. Telling you. Um, the only way you can find out for sure is to spay them. And then when the vet is inside there and remove, remove the ovaries, they'll be able to see if there's something wrong with it. Um, and they will remove, um, at the same time, they'll remove the wound because ultimately you might as well get it out of there because the other, there are other things that can cause temperament changes around the wound. Um, kind of different abnormalities, things like the starts of tumours, actual tumours. Um, so if they're in there removing the ovaries, you wouldn't just do an ovarectomy like you would on humans. I'm sure I pronounced that wrong. Um, you would do a full spay and, and remove the lot, basically. And that is a, a good thing to do because if you're in there, you might as well stop them getting the chance of pyo and womb tumours and such. And if, like anyway, because it's you're in, um, do the job properly, basically. Um, what you can find sometimes is uh, some does get a bit narky like quite early on and it might not actually be any obvious changes to the womb area it might just be they're a bit narky um, and that's a temperament thing um, much like us humans they get different personalities and it's quite um, interesting with with kind of books books uh, i often say these are a much simpler creature they've got much more simple drivers um, with the does they can quite easily get a bit fed up with other rats anyway um, and it won't be a kind of sudden temperament change they just get more easily nice so twizzle wherever she is um, is a classic one um, prior to a spay she, she didn't particularly like babies they annoyed her <laughs> she liked to knock them over and um, kind of tell them off quite firmly so they knew her place a lot of that might be because she's this like dominant rat trapped in a not quite so impressive rat's body i'm just going to stop somebody falling Yes, Wick. Wick was slowly rolling this off a work surface, which would have been bad. Um, so she's safe now. Um, yes, so Twizzle does... So she gets these delusions of grandeur when there is something that she can beat up. She would have a go at beating it up. And that worked until the babies got too big and then she didn't like that so much. Um, it's not such a bad thing that she spayed, um, given that would never ever have a litter from her again. Um, because... That way, she's got a little bit less of kind of a, an edge to it. And it's silly, really, but spaying does actually make a difference on doe behaviour, even when it's not polycystic ovaries or something like that. Um, it's not as a dramatic a difference as books, but in most cases, it just takes a little bit of the edge off it. They no longer go through heats, which tends to be the, at the most kind of easy to antagonise. Um, they, they seem to kind of like live in a slightly more relaxed frame of mind. Um, and actually Twiz has not got annoyed at the babies at all, even though they still kind of like to run around and chase her and hump her. It's revenge for when she was an asshole to them. And she did, does deserve it, to be honest. Um, so it's actually worked with her, which has been quite good. Um, but you can find that with those. You tend to get personalities um, that are a lot stronger. <laughs> not that books don't have personalities, but books' personalities are a lot more predictable. Um, it's all about their position in the hierarchy. With those, they could just take a dislike to someone or they could just be a bit narky, you know, not enough. They're not going to cause any major injuries, but they're just going to pick and be a bit bitchy. Um, it sounds awful. A bit like us girls can sometimes be. And not all of us, I've met plenty of bitchy boys. Um, but it's that kind of thing. It's that just little relentless annoyances versus punching somebody in the face, which is kind of like the male rat approach, and um, where they just bite somebody um, and injure them reasonably. A doe probably won't break the skin, they might break the ear, like every single one of my dumbos seems to get happen to them at some point. Um, but that's more kind of like just let's, let's tug at you, let's just tell you off a little bit, let's pull that tuft of fur out of you, but there's no, no wounds or no injuries. And that's quite normal, if a doe is going to be a problem, that tends to be the level of the behaviour it is. It's very rare to get a doe that causes serious damage. Some of that is they are physically less kind of muscular, less strong, and um, they might be more agile, um, so they can also get away from each other more when they're like, well, in that mood. Um, but it is it's a bit more kind of bitchy and picky um, when they tend to get annoyed. Um, so you can get that. It's, it's like with any animal, you can get an animal that's just not great with others. Um, and it got, ranges from the level that Twiz was at, which was 
a little bit anarchy but not bad you know she's, she's actually a lovely sweet rat with 90 percent of rats and 100 percent of humans which is why i bred from her to um i've had rats in the past that i would not breed from because they're assholes <laughs> and actually were spayed very quickly and still had a slight asshole edge but were tolerable and actually i could stick them with the boys so magpie was one of those actually not not for me so much but a previous owner um, she was just arsy to the rats all the time to the level it was kind of beyond a joke it wasn't just when they were at a certain kind of age it was all the time um, so she got spayed and actually that didn't fully resolve it though it improved it but the really important thing was she could live with my boys um, and that's transformed her she's a very happy rat content lovely member of the group now no problems um, so that is one thing if you get a doe that you are finding you're having problems with um, as much as it's it's not as straightforward as whip the bits off like it is with a book and um, actually spaying is just a really good idea assuming that they're up to it and if they're not up to it it's worth thinking about the implant um super lauren i think that's how you pronounce it um effectively it's something for ferrets and dogs and you want the dog size one for rats as much as that doesn't seem to make sense not the ferret size one um and it's a little implant and it will artificially suppress the, the hormones and there's some scientific studies of it being used in does it does in theory offer some some protection against getting pregnant but it is not full and it is not permanent and um there's only quite limited studies about how long it lasts so i would not rely on that as a means of contraceptive um, but it can be useful that if you've got um, a doe that's being arsy that is not a candidate for surgery it can calm down a little bit but it's not going to give you the option of putting them in with books um, which is where spaying is really just if, if you can do it and your vet's a decent vet and they don't use ketamine they use isoflurane it's worth just going straight for that as much as it's stressful um, because it is major surgery um, but it, it just it's got a better chance of being kind of successful in on multiple levels and you remove the risk of pyo reduce the risk of mammary tumors and reduce the risk of pituitary tumors which we'll get onto on the health section right so that's kind of general behavior behavioral problems that you kind of see um, you can, I've seen a little bit more what I would term senility in girls. I suspect that is actually linked to the fact they're more prone to certain neurological conditions than books. Um, but that's just them getting arsy into old, old age that's not necessarily associated with polycystic ovaries. Um, they can also just get a little bit confused, just strange behaviour. Um, one of my girls was the sweetest girl in the world, then gradually as she got older she just started biting people. And it wasn't done in an aggressive or nasty way, she just bit people. Um, she, she was spayed, it didn't go away, she just carried on and eventually she developed some neurological symptoms um, but she was a strange one, um, quite pleasant about it, didn't really break the skin but just bit you um, when, she, when she felt like it, not all the time, she'd lick you as well um, but yeah, so kind of a level of senility in a way um, so that's right into old age so introductions with girls, which is the kind of next logical thing from a behaviour point of view and links with what I've talked about so far now, doe introductions have got the reputation of being far easier than book introductions. I'm not sure why. Those people can't have done many. <laughs> or, or they've been bloody lucky. Um, I don't make that sound like um, doe intros are a nightmare. They're not. Um, most doe intros are very smooth. Um, you kind of like have a, a lovely group. Um, the does are quite tolerant. They're quite calm. You introduce some babies. The babies might kind of go a little bit insane and try and hump everybody. Um, the adult does put them in the place it's all sorted they're in the cage very quickly very smoothly no injuries injuries are far less likely in a doe introduction they can happen interestingly when they tend to happen they're either yanking the ears or they can be bites around the bits which is um not that common but can happen um fur pulling is much more common in, if you're going to have issues in in doe intros um it's fairly rare to get proper slash injuries which are much more common in book injuries book intros and that's where people are more afraid of book intros and when it goes wrong there is more damage and there is more risk um, books are far more likely and i say far more likely it's incredibly rare that it will happen um, but books um, are more likely to kill another rat in an introduction it's rare for a doe to do it unless it's confronted with a very young baby and that's too young to be introdu introduced and some does for some reason they're just um, I've, I've known a couple very rare cases and it, weirdly enough it's been when not in introductions it's been when um, the does have been out on their humans um, and they've just bitten a baby rat and killed it um, instantly um, but that is very very rare but I would just say if you're going to introduce 
like does that are unrelated to um, a particular baby um don't don't do it until they're old enough um, and that means a decent size stop biting my ear i've got twizzle biting my elbow and i've got worm biting my ear and then wick is trying to bite the microphone <laughs> yes i'm talking to you this is typical girls like when, when um going to the behavior thing <laughs> Um, when one of them comes to you, all of them suddenly have to be there and they all have to get into your stuff and find out what you're doing. Yes, I'm talking to the camera. So I've got four on me at the moment and before I had none of them on me, but they can't miss out. Um, even more so than books. Books don't tend to get quite as jealous, but the girls definitely do. And that might be part of what I'm talking about there. So the very rare cases where um, somebody's holding a baby right Yes, twizzle, that is my elbow still. I might just pull my sleeves down to protect um, precious elbow. Um, yeah, so there, it is possibly almost a jealous reaction because it tends to be an adult that's particularly close to the person involved and they see this baby as a threat. Um, but it is very rare. I've known of, you're talking about two or three cases of it happening in many years and knowing a lot of people. Um, whereas with books if it's going to happen it's more likely to happen into it in an intro type scenario whereas does tend to behave a little bit better in there um, so general intros then um, with does you don't have the same so with books we have this ticking time bomb of probably the wrong term really but this this age where the book scent changes does ch scent doesn't change like that um, if anything i found that the older the does get the easier the intros are so whereas most does are fine with babies babies are annoying and those more so um, those are a lot less tolerant than books of babies um, particularly when said doe babies are like humping humping them particularly when they hump the head that's quite offensive um, books don't really know what to do with that they just look confused does get pissed off some of them will just kind of really lay down the law at that point um, and that can that tends to be when your problems happen um, whereas you don't tend to see as much of that in books until they get a little bit older um, however most does are fine with babies and they're still fairly tolerant and they'll put up with it to a point particularly if they've been mums in the past which is why my intros tend to be fairly straightforward um, they just don't want they just want a little bit of respect and as long as the babies have a little bit of respect um, things tend to go quite smoothly what can help is if one of the does in the introduction is on heat then that doe is happy to be humped and everybody can join in humping it and for some reason it really breaks attention <laughs> uh, nice little party going on there um but yes so that that can help in an introduction situation um generally though you know some intros i've done you just put the babies in and there's been no problems at all and you've moved up fairly quick quick i, I tend to still do the carrier method with them um, they are more tolerant of different introduction methods than books so Things like neutral space introductions, um, cages side by side, unless you've got quite a dominant doe and then you'll notice them because they'll be huffing at the bars and pissed off. Um, that's not them being aggressive, by the way. That's them warning away an intruder that they don't fully understand. Um, it won't necessarily affect the introduction. But if you notice them doing that, don't do cages side by side um, because it's just winding them up. Um, whereas like with books i wouldn't even start doing cages side by side the majority of them will get pissed off by that um but yeah those are more tolerant for different introduction methods and it probably is why some people think those are far easier than books to introduce because they're doing neutral spaces or they're doing cage swaps or they're doing um cages side by side um and a doe will tolerate that a lot more whereas a book it's more likely to kind of wind up the tension and cause more injuries when they do finally get to meet each other um, but in a kind of carrier method, you don't really notice much issue other than this kind of if the babies are annoying and you've got a doe in there that's not tolerant of babies. Um, Snuffkin was one in her day, Snuff, um, Twizzle obviously, though she wasn't as bad as Snuffkin was. Um, Snuff has calmed down an awful lot now, she's mellowed with her age, but she did used to get really pissed off at babies. Um, and so I would have to kind of watch it with her. And actually what I found worked is sometimes moving them up a little bit earlier helped with um, Snuffkin because they were like crowding her slightly less. She could get away from them, put a wheel in so the babies could burn off their energy and would stop harassing Snuffkin. And that would settle things down. Um, Luna was another one. If you if you watch my introduction video, she she did not like babies. Um, what What's quite an interesting one, actually, Luna made me think of it is some lines interestingly um so does tend to take 
dislikes to certain writers. It's this personality thing. You get a clash of personalities. They just snipe at each other and be pissy with each other. It's the same with introductions. Um, what's quite interesting is thinking about Luna. Luna came from um, Halcyon's Topaz line and um, it took me a long time to get her settled with my group um, because she just used to piss everybody off in it. Um, to be fair, she didn't stop humping them from like morning till night. Um, and Summer, who was my most calm, careful, like patient rat, just ended up getting so pissed off and um, she ripped Luna's in. Um, and, and I didn't blame Summer for that one. Um, but that was during introductions and um, you know, I've never met Summer before I started doing videos, but she was a lovely rat. Um, but Luna was uh, from this Halcyon Topaz line and every time I introduced babies there was always problems. And it's interesting because I sent some Asamu Topaz, uh, an Asamu Topaz girl over to um, Lisa at Halcyon and she found exactly the same problems and, and she was really struggling to get my, my girl settled in her group of topazes, um, her topaz line. Then she tried it with the agoutis and they just went straight, best friends, fine, absolutely no problem whatsoever. So what we've discovered is the Halcyon topaz line and the Asamu topaz line, as it was a few years ago, now the Halcyon topaz line has a fair bit of Asamu in and um, hopefully with these wick babies I've got some Halcyon in my to topaz line. Um, but before that there was a distinct kind of personality clash between those two lines and it's something that we hadn't got any problems with the books because then um, there's also a book came across from Halcyon at the time as well um, and, and he, he was absolutely fine no problems with introductions at all it was just because with the books they care less about personality and more about hierarchy with the does they really do care about hierarchy and personality and that is one of the main things that makes in my mind dough intros harder than books because it's absolutely fine if they're all going swimmingly and well and everybody loves each other yes we all love you Rick um but it really doesn't um go well if they take a dislike to each other it's quite difficult to manage because it's not going to be resolved by time a lot of like just be by leaving them in a small cage together if anything that might make it worse and then get more pissed off um, sometimes you just have to bite the bullet and leave them in the big cage together and they may still snipe but they're unlikely to cause those kind of serious injuries or your other option if they're young is to give them a month or so to kind of age up so they get slightly past that annoying phase and they, they may tolerate each other a little bit more but what we, me and um, Lisa of Lovecraft um, find is we normally have one or two does um, each any one time they're just easily irritated um, and what we found works really well is actually having an awkward doe group and now this isn't possible for everybody you have to have a decent number of rats for it but when we do what we tend to do is move them in together and they're all like a little bit easily irritated um, they, they, they might nag at each other a little bit but the key thing is they're not picking on all the nice kind of calm rats that just want to be left in peace to enjoy life and, and love each other <laughs> Um, so moving them into a group together means they've basically got competition and what you'll normally find is one of them ends up being a really good alpha so Tato, who you may remember so just... the rats are trying to eat the, the uh, wood lice food <laughs> not at the moment, they're all obviously starving um, but yes, so whilst it might seem a little bit kind of like extreme you, you find normally that one of the rats, and, and Tato was an example of this ends up taking over and sorting out all the awkwardness Tato was another rat that was an ass with babies, but she was one of the best alphas for awkward rats we've had. So actually she ended up leading um, an awkward group that moved between me and Lisa a few times, um, depending on who had the best setup and who had the most rats that needed to be in that group at the time. Normally only about three or four um, rats in it. Um, but she was very useful because she was very good at kind of calming them down, settling them down. Um, and she she was amazing but in her own right she was a little bit awkward herself because she was a, a bit of a bastard in introductions i had to wait till the kittens were older and she would still get a bit annoyed at them a bit like twizzle did but um twizzle got defeated by the babies a lot earlier on <laughs> um bless her she's uh, just not not got it <laughs> whatever it is um she just can't hold her own against little tiny rats yes you were humping her weren't you man right so that's probably the main things with introductions um, with rat, with does and and part of the reason why it gets complicated is spaying them will help like I mentioned before but it's not like the switch um, it is with books so I would say I think we did a poll and it was something it was in the 90s percent 
of um, castrations done for temperament reasons resulted in an improvement, if not complete resolution. With spays, it was something more like your kind of 70% range, and then it's more improvements than full resolutions. So a rat that's been spayed, unless they were like really minor on that scale like twist, um, it's likely to still be a little bit sharp. Um, still, still kind of Twiz has just come to visit us. You've heard us talking about you, haven't you, Twiz? Yes, yes. Look at how her fur's growing back after her um, up. It's brilliant. Um, but yes, Twiz has kind of chilled right down. But she was pretty chill anyway, to be entirely honest. Um, and um, it was only very minor, her kind of arsiness towards babies. As much as Bug's ear does bear the brunt, but Bug was a little bit of a, an arse in return. Um, bless her. She, she was quite a strong-willed little, little girl didn't understand her size, um, which interestingly Moomin didn't even either in her day. Um, but yes, so it, it's probably not going to fully resolve it, but what it will do is give you the options to move her around, because for some, for some reason Twiz decides she's going to hate the next lot of babies, I can just move her in with my books. And it's handy because I've got both sexes, um, but what I could, I could also more e easily move her into another adult group if I had just those. Um, it is harder with those if you've just got one group because you do have to deal with the occasional um, rat that's very difficult to get on with others. But trying to give it time, like waiting until they're a little bit, um, the babies are a little bit older for introductions. So you're talking about, it tends to be easier after they're about three or four months old. Um, whereas with books, that would be quite hard to introduce. Um, shows they're quite, they're quite different in their own right. Um, and of course, I will say with introductions, if you're introducing a castrated book to the does, um, unless he's still fairly recent after his castration, um, when he might try and throw his weight around a little bit, the does generally just think he's a pillow and will use him as such, as Burko was for a long time. Um, Burko has now moved into the boy group. Um, that's purely because um, he was struggling to keep up with the does, much more active setup. Um, and actually is now living very happy as one of the boys. And finally, he, he no longer has a, a harem. He has to share um, magpie with the other boys. Um, but yes, he's very happy in that group for the Burko fans out there. Um, so that very long-winded waffly thing, I didn't think I'd talk as much about those as books, but clearly I am. Um, so that's kind of covered um, like their, their hormonal thing, which is a lot more linked with heats and how they can be worse when they're younger versus when they're older and they should settle down a little bit. How things like polycystic ovaries can come in and cause a kind of almost hormonal temperament change when they're a bit older. And I should, should say you're talking about typically over a year, more common over 18 months, that kind of age for your, your kind of polycystic ovaries. Um, and we talked a little bit about how you can get problem dose and it's a bit different than a hormonal book. Um, and how spaying can help, um, usually helps, but doesn't always resolve things entirely, but it gives you more options, which is always good. Um, we've talked a little bit about hi how hierarchy is um, in varyingly important to does and how it's, it differs quite a lot. It's a lot more complicated than for books and how intros are also a lot more complicated than for books. Um, but how you kind of like juggle what personality is in there and how kitten age impacts introductions most introductions we do, let's face it, are kittens to adults. Um, you tend to have less problems with adult dose to adult dose, interestingly enough. Um, whereas adult book to adult books, I can be slightly winces about, um, can be done, is going to be more challenging in most cases, but not all. Burko's introduction was just a breeze. Nobody seemed to notice it was in there apart from Burko. Burko pinned Sol. Sol got upset. Eclipse pinned Burko. Everything was fine. They, 24 hours, they went straight back into the main cage. <laughs> Good intro. Um, but yes, that's getting diverted. But um, and the main thing to, um, on there is doe temperament. They're not necessarily going to be insane nutters. Um, however, they are generally a little bit more active and they also need you a little bit less. Um, but that doesn't mean they don't choose you on a regular basis. Um, they are wonderful to be around and a lot of fun. So I do recommend them as pets. So that's over and out from me and the um, girls of Asami. 